did anyone go to the state fair and go to the concert on Friday night and see Foreigner? And did, so for those of you who did, you saw what I'm about ready to, to show you. Those of you who didn't, our new score kids from Smith Cotton High School took the stage at the state fair with Foreigner on Friday night. Isn't that great? We're super proud of them. Yes. And then we have a couple of our own up there, Meredith and Macy. They took the center stage. What a fun way to end your summer to take the big stage at the state fair. But we're thrilled for them, and what a great opportunity for them to be there, and we want to celebrate with them this morning. Well, I don't know what happened, but um, I took about two naps, and it was May, and now it's August. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I, the summer has just disappeared. My children go back to school on Thursday. Um, my old, our oldest son goes to college tomorrow, and then we have a daughter that's home, that graduated in the spring, and she's sticking around here. But I don't really like it when my children go back to school. I like having them home. And there's this little ritual that happens at our house. It happens the night before school. Everything's ready to go for breakfast for the next morning. I lay down in bed. Brian's usually already asleep. I lay down and I start thinking, did I save enough papers? Did I spend enough time with them? Did I do all the things I should do to be a good mom? Because now they're coming back to school and I start crying. And I wake up Brian to tell him all of these things and he's like, yeah, let's talk about this now. So... <laughs> So we're, uh, you know, he has to listen to me cry, and so I go to sleep, and the next morning I wake up, and we do the whole breakfast thing, and I get them ready and load them up to go to school. I have drivers now, so they kind of drive themselves, but when I could drive them, we would go into school. I didn't dare cry as I was dropping them off. But when I dropped them off, I got in the car and I called Brian. I just dropped them off and now they're gone back to school. And it starts all over again. And I cry all the way home. And I get in the house and there's this deafening silence. Because they're all gone. There's no more ESPN. There's no more Fortnite. Dude, over here, drop it. Why'd you do that? No more of those sounds anywhere. And then all of a sudden I look around and I think, if I clean this house, it's going to stay like it all day long. <laughs> and I'm quickly back into the routine of school, and all is well. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that all of us have been teachers. Many of you in this room are teachers. But all of us have been students at one time or another. And this morning, we're going to talk about when the teacher calls our name. Now, for some of you... You got a little nervous and a shudder went down your spine. But no one's getting sent to the principal's office this morning. But before we go any further, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time to be together, to worship you. You are worthy. Would you open our hearts and our ears to hear from you this morning, God? Would you speak to us? in a way that we know we can hear your voice. And Lord, would you speak through me. In thy precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in Isaiah 9, 6, we read, For a child, this is Jesus, will be born to us, and a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We should not be too surprised that Jesus was a good teacher because before he was born, the scriptures prophesied that, that he would be a wonderful counselor, a guide, a teacher for us. And did you know in the Gospels, out of the 90 times that Jesus is addressed, 60 times he was called teacher. And it says in John 13, 13, you call me teacher, teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Jesus acknowledges that he was a teacher. Well, names are important for Jesus, for who he was and is, and they're important to us as well. Now, for those of you who are coffee drinkers, does anyone in here have a coffee alias? Do you go to Starbucks and you give a name besides your own? Come on. Or when you do a reservation, you say, yeah, Abe Lincoln, party of five. Nobody? 
come on, you're missing out on a lot of fun. All right, well, we also have um, license plates, and there's mine, it's full of bugs, personalized plates, that's not how I spell my name, but it denotes that it's my car. And we also have name badges. They tell others who we are and give identity to what we do. I absolutely love going into stores and saying, well, hey, thanks, Wilbur, for helping me find that garden hose. And Wilbur's like, how'd you know my name? Because Wilbur forgot he had a name tag on for just a minute. You know, it's, it's a fun thing. And then when we go to Sonic, if anyone has the Sonic app, you can place your order before you get there, and you can get half-price drinks all day long. It should just mean you save money, but it means for me I get twice as many drinks than I was buying before. So I place my order, and when I pull up to the stall, I check in with the stall number, and then it says, Welcome back, Candace. So we enjoy hearing our name. Don't we like having someone use our name? Well, I experienced a name change when I was teaching. I started out teaching as Miss Halbrook. And during one summer, I got married, and I came back as Mrs. Fowler. Well, I was standing in the hallway at the beginning of the school year, greeting children as they went by, and one little girl came by, and she said, good morning, Miss Halbrook. And I said, well, good morning, Trista. I said, um, I'm Mrs. Fowler now. Well, she marched off, and she turned around, and she said, well, you look like Miss Halbrook to me. <laughs> but this name change meant not only a change in my name, but in my identity. I became a Mrs. And as we, reference, we see references in Scripture, we see that when someone's name changes or we see the meaning of their name denotes a relationship or something about them. We see the name for Isaac. When Isaac's mother, Sarah, was told she was going to have a baby, she laughed. And Isaac's name means laughter. When Esau was born, he had hair all over him. And Esau means hairy. So that's the name they chose to give him. Lucky kid. <laughs> then we have Adam. The Hebrew word is Adam, and it means from the earth. And we were created from the dust. All of these names have meanings, kind of like nicknames. Now, how many in here have a nickname? We have nicknames, usually from something we did, or it denotes a family name, or something about... Oh, an instance or an occasion or something. But did you know that Jesus had some nicknames for his disciples? We had Simon, who was the zealot, and Thomas, the twin. Now, we think of Thomas as t doubting Thomas, but that's not the name that Jesus gave him. Thomas wanted to see the scars in Jesus' hands and in his side to believe that he was the, had been resurrected from the dead. So we think of him as doubting Thomas, but that's not what Jesus called him. He called him the twin. So he likely had a twin brother or sister. And then there's James and John. They were the sons of, sons of thunder, and they would often raise a ruckus. And it's in one occasion that they were visiting the village of Samaria, and the people were not responding to Jesus the way that James and John thought they should be, so they wanted to bring down fire from heaven on them. That didn't happen. But that's how they were, these thund sons of thunders, raising a ruckus. And the disciple Peter, Jesus changed his name from Simon, from meaning God has heard, to Peter, the rock. Jesus saw something in these, these disciples, these followers of Jesus, and he gave them names that kind of resembled who they were, their identity, they spent a lot of time together, and they recognized his voice. Then there was Mary, who was Magdalene. Now, she was also a follower of Jesus. And in the first century, women would not have been called a disciple because a disciple was someone who was being mentored to replace someone. And as a woman, she wouldn't have been someone to replace Jesus. But the truth is, there were women traveling with Jesus and the disciples. And they traveled with them being taught and instructed by Jesus. And they were listening and learning from Jesus. And they were loving and being changed by Jesus. Now, we often refer to this Mary as Mary Magdalene. But I wanted to look at something interesting in Luke. In Luke 8, 1 through 3, we see her name specifically laid out. 
follow along as I read, if you would. It says, soon afterward, he, Jesus, went through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news that the kingdom of God and the 12 disciples were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. What I want us to look at is that it wasn't just Mary Magdalene. Did you notice that she's actually called Magdalene? So why was this? Was it a nickname? Maybe she came from the city of Magdala. We're not sure for sure, but Magdala was an ancient city located on the western coastline of the Sea of Galilee. But Magdala also means tower. And in those days, each city had this watchtower. And the taller the tower, the safer the city, because they could climb up and see anything that's happening on the horizons in case their enemies were coming after the city. So perhaps it wasn't that it was where she was from, but maybe what she did. Let's look at this next part of this passage. It says, Mag Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Mary had once been known as something different, but Jesus saw who she could be. Amen. Did Jesus see that Mary provided protection, that she was a watchtower for others? What did Jesus see in here, in her? This name was obviously important for it to be part of the scriptures. And then we read in the last part of that verse, that the women provided for the disciples and Jesus out of their own means. Mary, or Magdalene, had been important in Jesus' life. Jesus knew what she had been and saw what she could be. Now, throughout my years in ministry, I've had numerous people say to me, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, fill in the blank, well, my burning question for God is, of all the names you could have given people in the scriptures, could everyone have had their own name? We have more than one Saul, we have more than one John, we have more than one Mary. And so for us, the fact that Mary is called Magdalene, it gives her identity. It gives her a new identity to us so that we can kind of help keep those things separate. Well, my son Chapman and I were talking one day about names. Now, when I was growing up, I had the nickname Candy. And my family and my husband still call me Candy, and I'll go by either one, answer to either. So Chapman asked me, Mom, which one do you like best? Well, interestingly, Chapman has a nickname as well. Chapman's nickname is Chapman Do. When I was expecting Chapman, he's our fifth baby, a friend of ours who actually had served as a missionary in China said to me, statistically speaking, did you know at one time every fifth baby born in the world was Chinese? This is your Chinese baby. <laughs> so she lovingly named him Chapmandu. Well, Chapmandu was my fifth baby and the third one in three years. And I said, if he's going to get any name, it's so long, no more Fowlers. <laughs> Enough. But as we were talking about names, Chapman says to me, Mom, which name do you prefer, Candace or Candy? I said, well, I really don't have a preference. But it seems that when I hear God speak to me, maybe not audibly, but in my heart, God always calls me Candy. Chapman sits there for a minute and says, well, when I'm in public, I go by Dave, but no one knows that. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we see names changes in Scripture, it often denotes something new that God wants to do. I think that when God calls this person by this new name, it instills in them faith, a faith in God that God's part of these new things that are happening. It builds the faith muscles, and it brings peace when they know, yes, God is going to do this. Amen. So here's a name I mentioned last week in, in, our, in our scripture time. 
was that we had the name Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to um, Israel. Now, Jacob was named, known as a trickster, and he pulled a couple of fast ones in Scripture, if you'd want to look that up. But Israel, his name became having power with God. Having struggled with God and man overcame. Now, let's look at this next one. Follow along with me because the wow moment is coming at the end. But in Genesis 17, we see that Abraham and Sarah had a name change. They were originally Abram and Sarai. Now, I want to walk you through this, but in the Hebrew language originally, and it's been lost, but the letters told a story. They were symbolic. And the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet was Aleph, or the A, and it meant first or strength. The B was bet, and it meant home. So if you put those two letters together, the A and the B, you have first, or the leader of the home, which makes the word Abba, which means father. Then when we have the letter H, or the He, when we insert that into a Hebrew word, it means breath or spirit, behold, or revealed. Now we take that first letter, first two letters we talked about, the aleph and the bet, and we put the he in the middle, we have leader, spirit, home. And all that put together is ahab, which is the Hebrew word for love, or another meaning is the essence of God which is love. Isn't that cool? So, when we now we go back, remembering that the he means spirit, behold, revealed, when God did the name change of Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah, he added the H, or the he. He added the spirit of God to their name. And so every time they heard their name, they heard, God is in my story. Isn't that cool? Amen. It makes me want to throw an H on the end of Candace. Like, it's just, <laughs> like, it's amazing. So I have a question. How many of you are uh, sports people and you played ball, you know, played basketball, baseball, football, any of those things? You were on a team, sports team of some of degree. When you're in the middle of that game and the ruckus, the crowd is screaming and things are intense, what voice do you hear? Whose voice? The coach's voice. Or the voice you know. I've asked my kids a hundred times, like, whose voice? Did you hear your mom screaming? Did you hear your dad screaming? Well, sometimes we hear dad, but we usually just hear the coach. In, that, in the franticness of the moment, they hear the name they know. Well, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture with Mary Magdalene. It comes from John chapter 20, verses 11 through 12. Now, I want to tell you exactly what's been happening in this passage of Scripture. Because Mary has been, is at the tomb. Jesus has been crucified. This horrific, horribly painful, embarrassing death. And she's at the tomb. Now, I don't have to dwell on that too much. Because we've all lost someone at some time. So we know that feeling of despair. But this is where Mary is physically this is where she is emotionally. So if you'll follow along as I read in, out of John 20, verses 11 through 18. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over and looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? 
And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you've put him so I will go get him. Because at this point, she is so distraught. She's thinking, what more could you do to him? He's dead. Why have you taken his body? And then Jesus says to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. The teacher called her name. Jesus said her name, and it changed everything. And in hearing her name, she saw Jesus. And before that, all she could see was pain and despair. And it was overwhelming that she didn't even recognize Jesus. But when she heard her name, everything changed. Going on, she says, Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And she hugs him and she doesn't want to let go. And Jesus says, you have to. But in that moment, she has hope again. When she's hugging him, she hears her name and she sees something more than the despair that was before her moments ago. And that this is in this moment is what Jesus does for each of us. Amen. It's in that moment that we realize that we need a Savior. It's in that moment of despair that we feel this glimmer of hope. And we don't even know what it is, but we recognize that it's Jesus. It's in that moment that we step into the grace that's always gone before us and we say, yes, Jesus, I will follow you. Friends, Jesus is calling your name. And that's when it changes everything, when you hear Jesus say your name. Our names mean something to us and to others. And yet when Jesus sees us, Jesus sees our name and sees all that we can become. It's like when Jesus called Simon Peter, the rock, because Peter was instrumental in establishing the church after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension to heaven. Jesus saw who Peter would be. And the sons of thunder? James was the first one martyred for Jesus. And John wrote the Gospel of John in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He was known as the Apostle of Love. And Jesus says, I'm going to call you the sons of sons of thunder but boys i want you to make a ruckus for the kingdom and they did and magdalene was she called this because jesus saw something in her and maybe a watchtower for others seeing something first before others would see that because look at this verse in 18 it says mary magdalene went to the disciples with the news i have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said and these things to her. Mary calling out to others to tell them what she had seen, a watchtower, seeing things before others had seen it. Can you hear God's voice today calling your name? Maybe it's not a name, but a feeling. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said that his heart had been strangely warmed, but he knew it was God calling. If you look at your bulletin today, if you'll take a minute and look at that, it says, hello, my name is, and it's blank. Could you fill that in today? Would you take that home and let it be a reminder to you of the name that Jesus has for you? Maybe Jesus calling you and calling you to something different than you've called yourself, worthless or failure, and Jesus says, no, that's not who you are. And so you simply fill it in with your name because that's who Jesus sees you as. Or maybe you just simply put, I'm a child of God. Or you say, this is who you want to be, a light for God, a witness of Christ's love, a loving friend, a compassionate neighbor, a good father, a faithful husband or wife, a compassionate teacher, 
a dedicated student. Hello, my name is. Who are you? And who is Jesus calling you to be? Because the truth is this. I have a maker. God formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in God's hand. God knows my name. God knows my every thought. God sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. Would you pray with me? Lord God, your voice is so sweet and gentle and persistent, longing for us to know how we are loved by you and how we are seen by you, that we no longer have to be these other things, like Mary, who had so many things in her body that were overwhelming her, and you freed her from those things and called her to something different. God, help us each one today hear you call our names. And Lord, give us the boldness to respond. We love you, Lord. Amen. This morning we have an opportunity and a time for prayer.